Well, hello and welcome to another episode of the EcoCiv podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Schwartz, co-founder and vice president of EcoCiv. And it's a genuine pleasure to have with me today a friend uh, and colleague, Zach Walsh. Um, Zach is a systems thinker and environmental philosopher whose research has included, uh, among many things, a focus on rethinking the organization of human communities for an ecological civilization. So uh, a minor uh, area of focus, right? Uh, he was senior researcher of economics and governance at One Project, uh, a research associate for the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies in Potsdam, Germany, uh, and is now also completing his PhD in process studies at the Claremont School of Theology. Today, we'll be talking about changing worldviews, changing systems, uh, and transforming human communities for the long-term well-being of people on the planet, uh, or what we call an ecological civilization. Zach, thank you for joining me today. Well, thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure. Um, yeah, let's get into it. Let's get into it. So. I often want to start with sort of a framing of the situation, uh, sort of where are we? What's the problem? Like, why do we need to uh, transform or rethink human communities? Um, and so, so I guess my question for you is just to get us started, what's wrong with the way that human communities are currently organized? Uh, how is it contributing to uh, uh, problems that are uh, environmental problems um, and issues of sustainability? How is it contributing to social problems and injustices and inequalities? Like the, the very structure of how humanity has organized itself in society. Um, is there some particular piece that you can point to and to say um, the modern framing of civilization is just, you know, it's got some, some benefits, but, but really some fundamental problems and here's what they are. What, what would you say to that? Small questions. <laughs> we, we like to start off small. Right? Yeah, um, uh, the great, great questions. Um, I suppose we could stay with this for a long time too. Um, there are lots of different ways to answer it, all of which, um, you know, I'll touch upon a few different ways to answer it. Um, one first is sort of to, you, you mentioned I was a systems thinker, and I think that's, um, you know, I, did, I do a lot of things across a lot of disciplines, but that's a pretty good description of um, my focus and sort of uh, how I approach quote unquote problems. Um, so with that in mind, I think uh, the sort of crises that we face are interlocking, um, they're intersystemic, and uh, most of your listeners will be familiar with what those systems are. They're social, political, economic, um, but also cultural. And um, to name some of those um, that are implicated within the greater sort of socio-ecological crisis, uh, I think it's important to name um, capitalism, um, the sort of growth dynamics of capitalism, um, the ways in which it distributes wealth extremely inequitably um, and the ways in which it extracts resources, um, but also um, colonialism, I think, is extremely important to name. Um, the histories of colonialism that have happened over histories that are implicated, um, first and foremost, of indigenous people and also black um, folks. And then um, various sort of other intersecting uh, forms of oppression, uh, patriarchy, being a big one. Um, I was hoping you'd come up with another C <laughs> word, you know, it was like capitalism, colonialism, and patriarchy, that doesn't yeah. fit. So I mean, we will have to work on that, but. Um, yeah. um, and and I think it's also important to, to say human supremacy in the sense of um, humans over non-humans, humans over nature, um, that framing itself is inherently problematic and caught up in the problems. Um, and then various other forms of uh, ableism, um, ageism and you can go down the line, but all of those are uh, forms of othering, forms of oppression implicated in the crises based on a sort of um, power over, right? Um, so that's one way to sort of um, understand the crises and we could have a whole conversation on this um, and I'm sure we'll touch upon various elements. Another important uh, lens I think um, is just biophysics actually to be mm. frank um biophysics um 
and sustainability writ large or environmental sciences, human earth systems, sciences, complexity, uh, et cetera. Um, and when you get into that framing, uh, I think one way to understand the conflict is just this idea of um, overshoot, right? And so overshoot is consuming more resources than the environment is able to regenerate uh, in the time frame that you consume them. And it is um, based on sort of three primary factors. It's population, it's the rate at which you consume or economic activity, which is largely GDP as a sort of proxy for, and then um, efficiency. And we tend to focus on efficiency because it's um, a sort of low hanging fruit and it's business friendly. And so most environmental efforts uh, focus on that, like circular economy and what have you. Um, that is a limited way to understand it, obviously, because we actually need to address all three. Um, and again, uh, we can decouple and sort of um, go for more as well. But overshoot, I think, is, is primary. Um, and again, we can talk more about that. Um, maybe the last thing uh, before I pause is also that I, I think of, of late too, I've, I've stopped thinking of this as a problem solution uh, framing. And I think problem solution framings, first of all, lend themselves towards the idea that you can fix something um, often through some technical know-how technology um, or political will. Um, and again, uh, mainstream approaches um, use that framing predominantly, but they're inherently reformist in that. Um, they typically don't get um, for the intersectional inner systemic nature of the crises. Um, and the more and more I've learned of what's really going on and pouring through reams of data and also sort of practicing other ways of being, uh, the more I realized that actually that's the wrong framing. And so one of the ways I understand um, the realities now is actually that it's a predicament. It's not a problem in need of a solution. That's that's not actually um, possible. There is no solutioning. And solutioning, uh, I myself have been trying to do for a long time. <laughs> uh, and again, I think mainstream communities are stuck in that cycle of solutioning. Um, but uh, it's in some ways a dead end. Um, there are solutions to isolated problems, and we we have those and we need those. But the crisis as a whole is this lends itself to uh, eco civ um, it's a civilizational crisis um, so then you begin thinking of paradigm shifts of uh, thinking through civilizational history uh, as a larger frame and i find that much more accurate um, realistic and actually constructive it actually gives me uh, a greater sense of agency and we can speak more of how and why um, but i'll pause for now <laughs> that was a, a okay. brilliant summary of the complexity of our social environmental challenges um, and how to sort of frame an approach to addressing those. So I really appreciate that uh, sort of concise overview. And it has a possibility of taking us in a lot of different directions. Um, I liked in the first part how you connected, um, you know, issues of, of colonialism, capitalism, patriarchy, you know, all these sorts of things, which a lot of times in, uh, in and even in progressive circles where people care about these things, they get treated as sort of uh, separate problems. Um, and what I heard you doing was identifying otherness, in this case, as sort of an underlying thread that connects these various problems. Um, I wondered if you can build a little bit more on this sort of, um, I guess this, this common uh, frame, this common thread that runs through the various social environmental problems here. Um, and how you see, well, let me let me take it back. Let's just stick with otherness. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit about how you see otherness being portrayed in the way that human communities are currently designed? Uh, yeah, uh, I, I love how you actually ended that question uh, in the way human societies are designed. That's interesting to me, um, both because um, brings it out of the sphere of uh, worldviews and ideology and into the sphere of the interaction with social human sort of um, systems. And then also this aspect of design, which is um, bringing intentionality to it. So um, maybe I guess the first thing to say would be uh, leading with worldviews and ideology, which is important um, and bringing it to the scale of the, the issues that we've identified as being a civilizational 
crisis or a uh, crisis of paradigms, um, Danelle Meadows would say, right? Um, working at the level of paradigms is sort of the deepest level at which you can operate. And I think the crisis is at that level. So uh, there are many, many writers, some of whom you're in connection with, like Jeremy Lent and others who write about um, worldviews and ideologies and those that are implicated in the historical shift that we're undergoing. Um, so to name Jeremy Lent's got a great new book, you know, yeah. The Web of Meaning. Yeah. We'll give that a shout out right now. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and so what he and others, uh, myself included, are naming is the sort of modern paradigm, right? Um, a paradigm that is informed by European Enlightenment, um, forms of, as I said, patriarchy, human supremacy, and colonialism, also capitalism that were implicated in the same 400 plus year history. Um, and the ways in which, uh, as you said, othering is uh, fundamentally a separation of self and other, of, of, of discrete uh, individuals or entities um, bringing the process to you, right, that are isolated in some meaningful sense um, that can be analyzed, uh, reduced um, outside of context and this sort of web or, or, or mesh of relationships. Um, and that has informed science, technology, industry, education in many, many ways, again, which we could discuss, but um, suffice it to say, forms of othering that are culturally instantiated also are more deeply implicated in the sense of isolated entities, autonomous individuals, um, which harkens back to the modern sort of legacy, um, but which is not um, per se uh, the truth certainly, but also historically um, always been the case. Um, it's, it's unique to a certain period in time. Um, I'll stop there. <laughs> so I think you're touching on something that I, I want to follow up on, and that's this. Um, so the notion of individuality that is so central to um, mm -hmm. the modern worldview, right? So you even get with people like, you know, Rene Descartes, I think, therefore, I am. So like his very sort of understanding of how to know anything about reality begins with the acknowledgement of, of sort of the self um, mm -hmm. distinct from everything else. Um, and I think when we see within economic systems, education systems, uh, even like property, right? So, I mean, the, the focus on um, personal property is a very individualistic framework um, mm -hmm. and how communities have been designed in modernity uh, have largely been centered around the uh, autonomy and the sort of um, sovereignty of the individual. Mm -hmm. um, so what would an alternative frame look like? If we're talking about new paradigms, if the modern paradigm is one that's primarily about the individual uh, and the priority of the individual, uh, what would a sort of postmodern uh, paradigm for an ecological civilization look like? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I hesitate slightly to use the word postmodern, but I know also from our process context that has certain no, versions. No, deconstruct uh, it. Throw, go ahead. Yeah. You know, or and, and it's, thing to, do. to me, it's almost somewhere. You know, some people like I have uh, Daniel Gortz is a good friend of mine. Uh, we're talking about metamodernism, and it's it's actually postmodernism is re a reactionary sort of movement towards or against modernism, which uh, had utility uh, in a certain context, but which is limited again. And so I think we're, the pendulum is swinging back. And since the crisis is civilization and deep, um, or civilizational in a, a deep historical sense, um, I think what, what we, what is called for is a sort of transcendent included perspective because the, the individual, um, rights and liberties that modernity gave us in many respects are, are worth salvaging uh, within certain contexts, right? Uh, liberal democracy had certain affordances that were important um, and it was a revolution for its time, um, but also there are so many shadows of um, not sort of acknowledging the relational context in which um, we all exist. And so I, as you know, Andrew, work a lot on the commons and commoning as an alternative framing that is moving this shift in worldview towards social, um, economic, political sort of design, right? Um, and commoning also embodies um, a friend of mine, David Bollier and Silke Hofrick write a lot about this, an alternative ontology, an ontology that respects the individual. So it maintains a certain degree of um, 
individual sort of autonomy and sovereignty, but within a larger, greater context of relationality, which I think is more accurate to the, the reality. Um, to, in technical philosophical terminology, it's called differential or differentiated relational ontology. Um, and all that that means is that you're, you're sort of uh, maintaining the both and, right? You're maintaining the, the identity, uh, the difference that that suggests, and also this deeply relational context in which we all, all beings exist. Commoning now is a form of, of politics and economics, a form of organizing society that I think reflects actually this um, alternative relational ontology. And that's also why I, in particular, moved from process studies to uh, environmental sciences and sustainability to economic um, systems design and, and working with communities on the ground to um, spread comments. Because uh, I think that, that uh, maybe we could talk about this a little now too, um, is, is one hopeful um, aspect. And one really, I, if I had to put um, my finger on, yeah, where I see things going in the most positive sort of hopeful direction that would be um, spreading the commons. And there's a larger context to why um, I think that, but I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll don't make talk sure about you hope go yet. down that rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 don't talk about hope. That, you're stealing my thunder for later. We'll, we'll talk about hope at the end. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. You can talk about hope throughout the whole thing. I, I think what I like about what, you, what I'm hearing you say, uh, if I'm going to put words in your mouth, because why not, um, is actually stealing words from John Cobb's mouth, uh, which is what I prefer to do. And that's uh, to not get rid of the individual, which is not necessarily what John Cobb said, but what he did say was um, to rethink individual always as individual in community, right? Mm -hmm. Individual hyphen in hyphen community. Like it's uh, to be an individual uh, is to always do so in the context of relationality, um, which is interesting because I think then it's it's not a reaction sort of it's not anti-individualism it's not the response um to modernity it's uh, a widening of the individual to understand it in a larger context of community um so if we are to to do that in the context of of commoning um what exactly would it look like right so uh how would common goods be regulated for the common good so to speak right um or are they regulated or are they not? Like, what does governance look like? How is power distributed in the commons? Um, it, it, you know, is this a transition even possible? Um, how do we get from where we are to, to sort of what you're describing as this alternative paradigm? It's a whole lot in there. So feel free to respond to any of that that you want. Sure, um, thanks uh, for that. And I would say taking a step back, um, why, why, one of the reasons why this makes sense and why this is, um, I think the pathway that is worth going down is in the frame of civilizational history, right? Um, after we have collapse, collapses of civilization, which to be frank, happen every, on average, 336 years. And, you know, this is a cyclical process, I think. It's important to understand, really, <laughs> uh, that we are at the beginnings of a protracted period of collapse. Um, and I think we could spend some time talking about that, actually, because I think until you internalize that, which is a, a process that takes, myself included, um, has taken me a long time. Um, you haven't fully accepted the reality. Um, once you get there, though, you notice that after the collapse of civilization, there's a period of sort of uh, reorganization, right? So there is what's called the adaptation cycle. Um, and this is true of natural life systems, also true of social systems. They follow four periods. They follow a period of growth and then conservation and then collapse and then reorganization. And I would contend that we're between conservation and entering collapse. Um, and of course, there, 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 are, there is evidence of collapse already. Um, collapse is not an event, it's, it's more of a process, it's protracted over time. And um, many in the sort of advanced economies were insulated or buffered from the impacts um, of collapses already happening. Um, haven't fully internalized or experienced those. 
but of course, COVID is a great example because though many um, forget, uh, the reality is it's it's deeply implicated in our ecological social crises. Um, yeah, we don't, we don't have to go into detail, but um, well, just you, so we went we went from all this hope talk to now talking about collapse talk. Does that you know does collapse equal despair or does is collapse a sign of hope? It's, it is, I think it's, uh, it's a necessary stage um, to go through to uh, hope because otherwise hope becomes hopium. It becomes a sort of escape, a sort of form of bypass. Um, so my own experience is that um, going through this process of understanding that we're in entering a phase of collapse is actually a sense of, in a sense, get, re reclaiming my sense of agency. <laughs> um, you know, there's there are these seven stages of grief. I think we're as a civilization in, in need of a process of grieving. Um, and the first stage is shock, to be honest, and and that everyone is familiar with um, when they really dig into the details of what's going on. Uh, the next is denial, which you can see on front page uh, all the time, right? We're all familiar with that as well. Um, politics has professionalized it. Um, and then you know you sort of get into stages like bargaining which I think mainstream approaches to the environment are uh, really good at trying to come up with, again, uh, quick fix solutions, um, market-based and techno solutions to- Like a carbon out. tax. Yeah, I'm gonna, carbon I'm, I'm gonna tax. name it. <laughs> yeah, exa yeah, exactly. Um, and, and that's a coping strategy. Um, you know, it's effective in a very limited context, but it, it really doesn't um, help majority of people. Um, and, then, and then as you move, further and further down these cycles, you get to depression, which is an acknowledgement of the deep, um, you said sort of despair of uh, the dying of a world, because it's, it's at that level, it's, it's, you know, it's not the world, it's a world. <laughs> Indigenous folk know very well that they've already gone through apocalypses and, and they, they understand and have for much longer the most, um, the modern society which we've built is deeply unsustainable and in, in wrong relationship. Um, but I think for many people, they're just waking up to that fact. So we have to go through a certain degree of, of loss, of grieving um, in that depression and despair. I've gone through plenty. Um, but then on the other side of that acknowledgement of the reality, there's the positive, as you're saying, hopeful side that is realistic hope, not sort of an escape or a bypass. It's um, forms of testing alternatives of sort of realistic envisioning of, of within the field of possibility. Um, what can we do to make life better, not worse? And love to talk about that. Um, and then also just a sort of acceptance, like I said before, that this is a predicament um, and how do we responsibly engage within that space? So, you know, I think it's more complicated than, uh, again, the sound bites and, and the initial knee jerk reactions to the word collapse. Um, hmm. I think it's also though important to sort of go through why, why, because I think most people even haven't gotten to the, to, the, to the stage of understanding that it's, if not inevitable, very likely. Um, and I would say that's true just uh, from a purely scientific data driven perspective. And that's, that's honestly where I spend most of my time, um, understanding the data, the science, and, the, and then uh, the sort of cultural field around it uh, to the point at which you understand the possibility space and then can work within it. And then I just focus the rest of my energy on working within that space. Yeah. So let's talk about, uh, so you mentioned talking about like testing alternatives, right? Um, as, a, as a way of, of moving forward. Uh, can you give some examples of, of where you've seen alternatives to the modern organization of human communities um, and yeah. just sort of describe some of those alternatives and how they're working? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, this sort of loops back around to a couple questions ago, right? And this sort of idea of commenting, but also more writ large, like poster anti-capitalism or, or, or sticking with economy sort of forms of um, economic life that uh, were never um, limited to a modern capitalist paradigm um, and and that exists frankly every day all the time there there's evidence even in and I would say every everybody's life right even in the household economy uh, you share with your family and friends right that's you're not instrumentally or engaging in a sort of relationship where you're trying to extract value out of your family and friends I hope <laughs> 
Um, but uh, socially, right, um, one, I think, helpful framing um, is the solidarity economy. And the solidarity economy brings the commons in conversation with all sorts of alternatives to capitalism. So examples of that, um, many people are familiar with the cooperative space. Cooperatives are across all different sectors. So you have worker-owned cooperatives. So that's a productive form of business that's um, cooperatively owned and managed. So typically there are many different forms of cooperatives. There's um, retail cooperatives, worker cooperatives, housing cooperatives, land cooperatives, right? Um, the, the best um, give ownership rights, but also governance rights um, to every individual on a fairly equitable basis uh, using direct or participatory democracy. And so another sort of um, way for people to understand this is it's applying the ideas of democracy to the economy. And I think right and left people, no matter their political persuasion, can appreciate that idea because it's, it's really allowing, uh, giving a sense of agency back to people. Creates equity, first and foremost, and it also typically creates sustainability because there's a real relationship um, to the environment. Uh, I could give more examples, uh, you know, credit unions, uh, complementary currencies, especially mutual credit. Uh, that includes time banks, but also, you know, crypto. There's forms of crypto commons, which are really interesting, exciting, uh, that are distributing value in a democratic basis using these technologies. Um, you know, another framing that's helpful to understand is um, commons are not one thing. There are natural commons, so air, water, soil is typically um, something everybody understands or should be <laughs> held in held in common. Uh, shouldn't be privatized. Shouldn't be owned by any individual or corporation or state even because uh, there's mismanagement and um, poor incentives in that. Um, there's also social commons. Everybody typically. Um, in more enlightened places uh, than the US enjoys uh, health healthcare like in Europe um, and uh, other forms of provisioning. So Roscoe's, things like that, that are rotating and, you know, savings and credit associations where you're pooling risk and you're in a community of people who are sharing risk, but also um, taking care of each other. Um, there are forms of digital commons like Wikipedia, everybody's familiar with. Um, that are sort of open source, right? The open source movement uh, where benefit is distributed, but also people can contribute pretty freely. Um, and then there are productive commons that sort of mentioned work around co-ops, but there's this idea of cosmolocalism, which is, which is really compelling where uh, production is not globally distributed, which is what the capitalist sort of maximizing in efficiency sort of way. Um, it's, it's rather relocalized and this is the direction we need to go to, but also distributed and meaningful way to reclaim a, a sense of local agency, um, but also in a way that uh, resources are drawn back to communities, um, things are more sustainable, supply chains are more distributed, um, what have you. That's a that's a just a very brief. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's a there's a whole host uh, within a certain um, sphere of alternatives that are operating in parallel that are implicated in this sort of commons or paradigm or post capitalist or solidarity economy paradigm. And I think that is the, the direction we need to go. Um, first, because as I said before, that's what creates regeneration and the paradigm after collapse that we need to engage as reorganization and regeneration. And secondly, because we need to create equity, especially under uh, systemic con constraints. And I think they're, you know, to put it in the most simplistic terms, they're really just two archetypal, right, directionalities to this crisis, which is the sort of, Joanna Macy calls it the great unraveling or the great transition, right? It was sort of positive and negative. And I think both are true. Um, in political terms, you could also say like eco fascism or eco socialism, eco anarchism. It's the difference so you, between, yeah. between yeah. equality and equity um and um in a in a sort of low growth or no growth situation um, sorry. so you, you said yeah. socialism yeah. and i think some people might hear when you're talking about commons the common good commoning it's like oh so basically just communism like you're just a communist so that's anti-american so just you know get out of our country um you know uh you marxist uh so like is 
I mean, is that basically what we're talking about? Is just a shift from uh, democracy uh, and freedom to communism, where everything is centralized, you know, by a, a state power and distributed, uh, you know, where, I mean, what what exactly does the future look like when it comes to uh, the distribution of power, how decisions are made? Um, I mean, you talked about localization, uh, but does that get rid of globalization? Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I mean, there, what do you there say are to multiple, that? yeah, there are multiple realities. So it's like, um, who, who am I to say that this is what's going to happen? I can only hope um, and put my energy in a certain space. And that space is the commons and commoning, but it's it's not what you described as either state managed capitalism or communism. Uh, communism, um, uh, you know, it's got a long history. It's got many variants. There are strands within Marxist theory that are useful for understanding capitalism to be frank, but um, the, the historical experiments with communism have been pretty terrible. Um, I am no advocate of those. Uh, the state forms of communism, certainly not. Um, again, we could have a whole conversation. Um, commons, though, is uh, unlike state forms of communism, deeply, deeply democratic um, in ways that those weren't. Um, and so, you know, we, we could talk at length about why. Uh, going back to the point about um, we had before the individual in relationship and the sort of ontology that that suggests, the commons is attempting to organize economies around communities. Communities are different than the state, okay? Um, communism, I think, has, has a history of, um, of hierarchy oppression, um, exploitation wrapped around the, the idea of the nation state and ideologies and what have you. Um, capitalism though is, is, is no better in that sense. Is, it's, it's enmeshed within the state and forms of uh, hierarchy oppression and exploitation. The commons, I think, and it's turned towards deep democracy uh, tempts and it's, often obviously in practice very difficult because it's people are people <laughs> all fallible but you can create systems that uh, are pretty robust to attempt uh, deeply democratic economics and politics where uh, agency is distributed so you know we have to start throwing out examples to make this even more concrete one one example you said how is power distributed right um one one way is that uh it's not actually hierarchy and it's actually also not flat so to your point, it's neither local nor global. Um, it's it's some integration of right uh, these these multiple poles, right? And therein lies also the process perspective. There there are different poles that you have to integrate. Um, the commons in doing this uh, operates more on a hierarchical um, sort of standpoint and heterarchical uh, is a sort of combination of hierarchy um, and flat ontology. And so what that means practically to make this more understandable um, is that people have differential responsibility and uh, their roles are reflective of their interests, their uh, capacity to contribute, et cetera. So they have more influence over let's say an organization. So if I'm joining a cooperative that's operating on this common basis, I might uh, make decisions that affect everybody. Let's say because I uh, work on quality control. Okay, quality control is very important because uh, if I'm producing something, uh, my decisions are gonna affect everybody. And I'm afforded that by everybody, okay? Um, they give me that authority to make those decisions because of my skills, capacities, and interests. They don't do it out of authority. Everybody has the same authority to make decisions. So there's a distinction between your roles, responsibility, and ability to influence an organization, let's say, versus your authority. Um, if decisions affect everybody in the same way, let's say like pay rate, like I have, should not have a greater authority than anyone else to, to decide how much you get paid. Everybody should have equal authority to make that decision. So you see what I'm saying? There's there. It's more complex than communism or capitalism, which is a good thing. Um, it's it's deeply relational, but also affording every individual um, within their sphere of influence the authority to make decisions. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah. So I'm hearing things, you know, like, um, so you're not getting rid of individual and you're not getting rid of um, sort of authority or hierarchy even, uh, but that you're reimagining individual as an individual in community and you're reimagining power in hierarchy as within the context of, again, communities of communities. Um, and that in a sense, you know, decision-making power over people's lives is, is more closely tied to the people being affected by those very decisions, uh, which means greater control, uh, which, so when, I think when people hear, you know, eco-socialism, they might think communism, they think commons, they think communism, and then they're thinking, oh, so basically you're losing control. And then the, there's going to be sort of a top-down mandate that says, um, you know, everybody has got to go stand in a bread line um, and, uh, you know, you can't use your, you know, your, your car, uh, you know, on the weekends because we're trying to reduce carbon emissions, you know. Um, but what I'm hearing you s described is, is actually um, giving more power to the people, uh, mm -hmm. more autonomy and authority over one's lives. Um, so it's an, it's an empowering of, of the individual, not a, a disempowering. Is that right? I mean, 100%. I mean, to, to put it in simple terms to the current economy, which is market based and capitalistic affords power to those who have purchasing power. I mean, you frankly, like have more money, you have more authority. And the more and more that's infiltrated into state politics, um, the same is true within that governance sphere. Um, but traditionally, too, those who are representatives um, in a representative democracy were supposed to uh, reflect the public will. But the way it's it's been practiced through voting, um, midterm elections, elections every four years, like it's just been co-opted. Um, but even in the case of being representative, that's actually a really old three three hundred year technology that is outdated and only suitable for very limited amounts of purposes. There are forms of deep democracy, participatory democracy, digital democracy. Um, there's a whole wave of innovation. Um, of tools and techniques and practices that I think are much more suitable, that are uh, allowing people um, greater agency, as you said. But that's that's what I'm interested in. That's what the Commons brings to the conversation. Um, and 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 it's there is no, you know, we need to complexify the conversation because there's no one practice or tool or technology we need to in this web of relationships understand what's suitable, when, how. But fundamentally, it's the move away from uh, markets and state towards um, the commons, which is deeply democratic and affording each individual a certain sphere of influence within a community that they ascribe to, frankly, as well. That, you, you know, you have the, the capacity to opt in and opt out of a commons. You, you, you're not oppressively required or forced to participate. You, if you choose to participate, subscribe to certain rules of governance. Um, and therein also lies, as you said in your earlier question, the sphere of regulation and how we choose to co-manage a given resource or, or what have you. Um, but we don't have that power. None of us have that power hardly in our current society, unless you have loads of money or, you know, inheritance or some political uh, capacity. You know, I think right. something you said made me wonder if um, new technologies are actually making representative democracies obsolete um, in that uh, there might be alternatives that we can use through, you know, mm. new communications. But anyway, we don't have to go into that. I think that's a distraction. What I do want to talk about, well, maybe it's not an unimportant distraction. There's so many things. Um, <laughs> yeah. But I think that what I'd like to talk about more is huh? the, I, so you had said that, um, mm. you know, the previous uh, sort of, uh, instantiations of, uh, of Marxism have not really gone all that well, right? Uh, so the examples of alternative democracy, mm -hmm. are there examples of, of more of a commons-based organizational structure that we've seen as successful that we can point to, and perhaps maybe even looking to nature in a sort of biomimicry, uh, you know, is, is there something, can we look in the world around us and say, that's an example of what we uh, are talking about on a larger scale. And we want to sort of use that example as, as a model uh, that can be replicated uh, in terms of reorganizing human communities around these sort of principles of, of the commons, uh, common mm -hmm. goods of, of community even. What, does that make sense? 
It does. Um, and I think, you know, there are so many examples. So one resource I sort of already mentioned that I would point people to is this sort of more anthropological work and documenting of case studies that David Bully and Silke Helfrick have done in their trilogy of books, um, because there are dozens and dozens and dozens of examples of whether it's a business, an organization, a natural resource, uh, you know, digital tool or service, like whatever your sector, there is an example of a commons um, in that sector that you can look at and learn from those and then find best practices and ways these have existed throughout history and also are existing now. Um, and these are not new. Um, and at some other level, there's innovation, as you said, like indigenous people often had um, operated around commons. Um, but there are new affordances with urbanization and um, sort of technological innovations um, that allow commons to take other shapes. Um, and those are interesting uh, as well. So, you know, an, an example of like an urban commons would be um, co-cities, they're called. Uh, there exists hundreds around the world um, or sharing cities. Um, a, a lot of them, for instance, like in Europe and Italy, right? There was a legislation called the um, Bologna sort of regulation on the commons that uh, allowed commons to propagate across Italy after the, the recent financial crises, especially in which um, commons started to connect across sectors in that country. And the same is true like in Spain, where you have uh, one movement I love is the integral cooperatives in Spain that started in Catalonia, but have actually um, propagated in Madrid and other places in Spain, and also now um, are beginning to go to other countries. Now, the reason I partly also mention these is to your metaphor of ecology and nature. Um, no matter the sector, uh, you can organize around a commons or a cooperative um, and then also link up with others to create a kind of web of mutuality. And that is uh, really the exciting direction I see hopefully things <laughs> going if we all um, put our energy in that space. And so creating a under systemic constraints with the collapse of civilization, these webs of mutuality, um, whether it's uh, food sovereignty, energy sovereignty, right, um, productive commons that are manufacturing um, goods and services, healthcare and social commons, providing care work, all of these different commons can link up and integrate also in larger systems, financial systems of, of credit commons, um, crypto commons, different forms of uh, currency uh, that are absolutely necessary um, as the debt bubble and debt crises come. I think, you know, the first sign of really global collapse will be financial collapse because as growth ends, um, it's already on a protracted decline. Uh, the debt-based currencies that demand growth and the entire system that demands growth um, will collapse. And so these other alternative forms of uh, financing will be able to hold the sort of web of mutuality of products and services and organizations. And, you know, all these things are coming together, but they need to come together to provide also sort of safety net, um, to provide equity on a generalizable basis as, as um, again, um, resources and energy become more scarce. Um, you, cannot have, yeah. um, you cannot have the degree of inequality that we have now, um, without war, violence, death. Um, you can't sustain that degree of inequality. So there has to be this move towards a web of mutuality. And there are, as I've been saying, organizational forms to do it. So you've already started answering my next question, which is basically um, a thought experiment, right? I, I want you, you're, you're gonna be an artist, okay? You're gonna paint a picture of the future for me and, and just dream with me for a moment, right? So whether we're talking uh, 10 years out, whether we're talking 50 years out, I want you to imagine mm -hmm. uh, a, human communities being reorganized uh, toward the commons to maximize the long-term well-being of people on the planet. In 30 seconds, you know, paint this picture what does it look like, right? What's housing like? What's transportation like? How do humans relate to each other? How do they relate to nature? What's the economy like? What are governance? I mean, if you just had to describe 
this new ecological civilization mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. established around uh, around sort of the framework of, of the commons. What is it like? To be honest, it's rich. And it's, it's, it's a way to, and this is the real difficult problem, I guess, for lack of a better word. Um, it's ensuring actually if possible, and it is possible, a higher quality of living under um, sort of protracted decline or collapse, right? And um, this is the way to do it because as we've been discussing, people have a greater sense of empowerment and agency and things are more equitably distributed to the extent that they're participating in systems, creating and sharing value. And in that also part of something greater than themselves in ways that today is not the case. So there is a greater sense of solidarity, of mutuality, of being in relationship to people around you, to nature, to right? And, and also with that, a sort of participatory dynamic. So people that are suffering, and we all are, from the collapse of the social fabric, the alienation and isolation that comes from living under state, you know, capitalism, what have you, like, we now can write this story together. So that would be my soundbite. You know, th this is literally in times of crisis, us responding in the positive way of coming together in solidarity and creating systems that can not just survive, but in many real ways thrive under constraint compared to the alternative, again, meaning practice business as usual and people not putting energy in this reality, then you have greater violence, war, death, inequality, et cetera. <laughs> yeah. You, you make me want to grab my Legos and build that world. Uh, it sounds it sounds like a, a good oh, place to live. Yeah, yeah we all need um, So so I guess my, my practical question is, what do we do now? Like, how do we get there? Uh, can we work within our current systems? Uh, does an ecological civilization require the collapse of modern civilization? Um, are there some, you know, basically, what are the major obstacles to realizing the vision you just put out there? And uh, what do you see as the key leverage points for change? That's a great question. I appreciate it. Um, and again, so many ways to answer that. I mean, first, obviously, is everyone um, participate? And in and, so far as you can and is meaningful for you and uh, for everybody, that's going to be different. So really, there's no judgment in, in what you do and how, so long as it's in this direction, right? Um, I would say uh, in the direction of solidarity, care, love, um, and building systems of resilience and regeneration outside of the current paradigm. <laughs> um, now, within the systems that we have there, that's not to say there, there could still be reforms that open up space is a possibility for, for propagating this, this new paradigm, right? So it's almost like a both and in the sense of like, many reforms are obstructionist and actually are not helpful, but there are a few things that could be done from a reformist point of view, right? Policies, legislation, tweaking some certain things, rules within the current system that would open up space for this other system, right? But um, again, you know, there is many ways as, as as there are people to answer that question. So it's more about really first, I would say first, what's obstructing progress is actually a coming to terms with the realities. Going back to the discussion of not just collapse, but also what, um, why, <laughs> like why, like first, we didn't spend, I, I think enough time educating people as to just the biophysics of why uh, that's just what our lives will be shaped by in the, 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 the course of our lifetimes. And, and I think that's the first step because you can't really meaningfully in the larger sense, right? There are certainly things that you can do in a more limited sense, but in the civilizational sense, um, until you come to terms with that reality, things that will really um, radically in the time span that we have move us in the right direction. Now, once you come to terms with the biophysics of collapse and, and understanding our situation, then moving towards this alternative paradigm of solidarity, relationality, and mutuality, building systems of resilience and regeneration. We all can do that. There's many books. Uh, there's many ways to participate, even in local communities already at this time. Everybody just has to identify what those are. And, you know, therein lies another podcast, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think there's a lot that uh, 
that we've said so far that sort of leads on to, to ongoing additional conversations. I, I promised that we would get back to hope before we were done, and I want to give you that opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, I think when I hear what you've just described, uh, when I hear words like collapse, when I hear uh, the, the complexity of the challenges before us and how um, we're talking about major, you know, the biophysical, the, the social, uh, mm -hmm. the economic, I mean, we're talking about post or alternatives to capitalism. Mm -hmm. We're talking about, uh, you know, new governance systems. We're talking about, uh, you know, mm -hmm. changing our, our worldviews, our, 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 in, you know, building, I mean, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a lot, right? I think it could be very yeah. overwhelming for people yeah. to say, okay, yeah. this is, yeah. this is massive. And I don't even know where to start, yeah. but I've also already heard you allude to, to some hope. And I want to, I want yeah. you to elaborate on that. Yeah. What reasons do you have for hope? Not, not in this sort of utopian sort of blind sense of, well, yeah. everything's going to work out. I mean, yeah. the realistic yeah. hope that there uh, is something better yeah. to come. Uh, all right. Um, I mean, first, first, first again, is just to be kind to yourself and to others. I mean, I know that's trite and cliche, but, um, also in the context of this process of internalizing, um, the situation or predicament that we're in, because I, you know, it is overwhelming. Um, we all are going to experience those stages that I mentioned, shock, denial, anger, right? at injustice, um, bargaining, um, but to be kind with yourself and, and afford yourself the space to go through each of those stages as well and, and to come to terms with them because it takes time. Um, I don't you know, take that lightly and I'm still coming to terms with these things myself, but um, the sooner we could do that collectively, culturally, um, the better position we're in because then the more we can adapt to, to the real big changes on the horizon. And that's hopeful the last point, because um, again, as we've said, it's it's a reclaiming of agency and, and power to the people in a in a global or systemic context where oppression, exploitation, extractivism, these things do not have to be the rules by which the system operates. I mean, that's historic, and so there is both a crisis, right, a sort of, um, but also an opportunity in in that to redefine ourselves to rewrite our the human story um, collectively on the basis of deep democracy. Like what could be more hopeful than that? <laughs> well, Zach, this has been a, a really wonderful conversation. I've had a lot of fun. I learn a lot every time I talk to you. Is there anything else you'd like to say? Anything you're working on that you want to plug? Now is your opportunity. I can't think of any plugs. Not good at that, unfortunately. <laughs> but uh, I mean, honestly, it's this is a bid for connection too. So if there's anyone listening on this podcast, or you know, who, who connected with some part of this, I'd love to hear from them. Um, we all need to be in relationship. Um, we we all need each other in this. You know, you can move to New Zealand or Iceland or the UK, which are going to be more buffered than others, perhaps, but it's it's honestly a false choice because uh, we're all affected um, some more than others, unfortunately, but the, the, the more that we hold each other, uh, the better off we'll be. And again, we can all live better lives than we live today, typically, um, if, if we do that. And so I would just say, reach out, um, do what you're doing, Put your energy in these places but also take care because this is hard i mean we there's so much that we didn't touch upon and one of those things is that this is hard work it it, it affects you on all different levels spiritual psychological emotional right um so take care um keep fighting keep keep working uh connect and yeah i hope to hear from you and and learn from each other you know um and thanks andrew for hosting Thank you, Zach. Let's uh, build a better world together. Yeah.